everybody. Welcome to Think Outside the Board. I'm your host, Brian Tui. Uh, for those of you who have been here before, welcome back. For those of you who haven't, I put out these videos twice a month. They are monthly updates, but I'm calling them Kickstarter updates now because they focus primarily on currently running Kickstarters, what I think are the best Kickstarters out there. And so I'm trying to do these videos to help people decide what to back, what's safe to back, what's good to back. I'm just trying to pick through all the chaff to find you the best stuff on Kickstarter to back. So here's how these videos work. The first section is a section on the currently running Kickstarters that I'm recommending to you. And the period for this video is going to be May 3rd through May 16th. So first half of the month. I'll be back in two weeks with another video for the last half of May. And then after we go through that information, I will talk about games that I personally backed from the last video. And then I will also briefly talk about games that I've acquired since the last video. And then for the final section, I'll go into a little more detail with the games that I've actually personally played since the last video. So let's get started on these currently running Kickstarters that you may want to back because they're really cool. Uh, when I go over these, I'm going to uh, first kind of talk about stuff like the financing, the date that it funds, uh, the weight of the game, the player count, what I think the kind of risk value is. Then I'll talk about the people who created the game. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the game itself and we'll talk about price points. So let's get started. The first game on this list is Marvel United X-Men. And I'm also gonna tell you whether or not I'm planning on backing these games, and this is not a game that I plan to back. And uh, my reasons for it are, it's just a lot of money, it's a very light game, especially the base game. I think though if you like Marvel a lot, and you like kind of miniatures fighting game, and you like lighter games, this is a great game. There's so much stuff. You're gonna have miniatures for so many characters in the Marvel Universe. Okay, so they've got dupe on this campaign. That's sort of obscure in the X universe. My point here though is this game has probably more, more characters and stuff than any other Marvel games out there. So this may be a game for you. Now, the minimum requested funding for this game was $300,000. <laughs> it's not, not a small amount. They are currently at 3.5 million and that is 12 times their asking price. This is a light game, okay? This is a very light game. It plays one to four players. Uh, I would put it on the low end of the risk though, maybe medium low. Uh, it's by Simon or Kaman if you wanna pronounce it that way. And they got into a little bit of financial difficulty in the last year or two. A lot of people don't like the way their campaigns are structured. Also, they tend to never tell you uh, everything that's in the campaign until the last day. And so when you get into these CMON Kickstarters, you may think at the very beginning, oh, that's great, a $100 pledge, that's what I want. The problem is that won't get you everything. And by the time they've put all these add-ons on, once you kind of total up that along with the shipping, these CMON campaigns tend to run four or $500. So they're not cheap and not everybody likes it because of the way that they kind of add things on as they go. Uh, it can make people feel like they have a sinking feeling because <laughs> they want the game, but they don't want to pay four or five times what they thought they were going to have to pay for the game. What makes Simon partly appealing though is the amount of stuff that they get. And it is better priced than you'll find it anywhere else. So to try to get this stuff later and kind of cobble it together at MSRP prices, you're gonna pay a lot more than they sell it for. Also, if you like miniatures, they have good quality miniatures and some people like to paint the miniatures. But there's a game here too, <laughs> X-Men United. People seem to like it. It seems to be more kind of family weight, casual, uh, at least the base game. And then you can add on expansions. There's more mechanics that come into play. So it increases the complexity a little bit, but it's still gonna be a light to medium light game, probably at the highest complexity, it's medium light. Maybe it pokes into medium heavy a little bit. Anyway, this is a miniatures fighting game. It is Marvel themed. You're not going to have as deep a Marvel miniatures fighting game anywhere out there. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff. So let's talk about people for a minute. This is by Simon. So I'm gonna read some of this because it is a lot to kind of keep in my memory, even though I know a lot of this stuff. Uh, so if you see me looking off camera to grab some information, 
gotta do it for some of these. Anyway, Simon has done, in the past, Arcadia Quest, Arcadia Quest Inferno, Blood Rage, Cthulhu, Death May Die, Blue Moon City, Ethnos, Gizmos, The Godfather Corleone's Empire, Marvel United, of course, The Grizzled, they did a redo, kind of a reprinting of The Grizzled that also had miniatures in it, uh, Massive Darkness, Modern Art, The Others, Unfair, and the whole Zombicide series. Now, they do a lot of Kickstarter stuff, but if you're listening, you heard in there some other games like The Godfather Corleone's Empire that did go straight to retail, so they don't just do Kickstarters, although that does seem to be where their bread and butter is. The first designer on this is Andrea Ciarvezio, and he has designed Hyperborea, Kingsburg, Marvel United, and a game called Signatory. Then we have Eric Lang, who any good Simon fanboy probably knows the name of. He's done a lot of stuff. So here we go. Arcadia Quest, Arcadia Quest Inferno, Blood Rage, Chaos in the Old, old World, Cthulhu Death May Die, A Game of Thrones The Card Game, The Godfather Corleone's Empire, Lord of the Rings The Confrontation, Marvel Dice Masters Avengers vs. X-Men, and Marvel Dice Masters Uncanny X-Men, and the game that kind of predated those games, Quarriers, uh, The Others, Rising Sun, Star Wars The Card Game, Warhammer 40,000 Conquest, Warhammer Invasion, and XCOM The Board Game. So, very prolific designer, Eric Lang. He's designed a lot of games. And the third designer on this game is Francesco Rugerfred Seto, and this seems to be his first design game, for the most part. The artist on this is Edward Guitton. Uh, he has worked on Marvel United, Massive Darkness, as uh, Zombicide, Zombicide Season 2, and Zombicide Season 3. Now let's talk about the pledge levels for this Kickstarter. So for $65, you can pledge for Marvel United X-Men with an exclusive villain team, which includes Toad, Pyro, and Blob. So exclusive villain team means that this will not be available at retail, just like I think, what was it, Wasp and one other character are not available at retail except through exclusive. So Toad, Pyro, and Blob may not be available at retail depending on whatever deals that they work out. For $100, you can get that same package plus the Horsemen of the Apocalypse expansion, which will include an exclusive hero, Mohawk Storm. That's it. That, those are the only pledge levels for this Kickstarter. But that's not all you can spend because there are a lot of expansions that are not baked into a pledge level. But if you buy all of those expansions as add-ons, that's gonna be an additional $290. So 290 plus 100, that's 390 plus shipping. I'm no longer trying to work uh, shipping charges into these videos because it's different for everybody, no matter, you know, depending on what country you live in. But yeah. Then they also have stuff available from the first Kickstarter. So if you want to add on all of those add-ons, which will get you almost everything from the first Kickstarter, except for, I think, one or two of the exclusives uh, that are not available through here, but it'll get you everything else, those are 220. So if you put those new numbers together, 290 and 220, you're looking at 510 plus the $100 pledge for this, this is that's $610 plus your shipping, which is probably gonna, I mean, I don't know what it is. I haven't looked at it, but it's gonna bring you at least up around $700. That's if you're trying to get everything from the past Kickstarter and everything from this one. So there's a lot, you, a lot of cheddar you could drop on this. You can do it in two wave shipping if you wanna get the old stuff sooner. And in that case, you would get that you know, the Marvel United, the, the first Kickstarter stuff will come to you in September 2021. So, and I don't think I mentioned it at the top, but this uh, campaign will conclude its funding on May 5th, which is going to be Wednesday. And hopefully this video will be up tomorrow on Sunday, so it'll give you guys a chance to process this video, a couple days to catch it, and then decide if you want to back things. So, Marvel United, it's the first campaign that we're talking about. Funds on May 5th, delivers May 2022. Next up is The Shadow Planet, the board game. And this is also going to fund on May 5th. They had a minimum requested funding for this project of 36,000. They're currently sitting at about 35,000, so they haven't funded yet. However, I know from my experience with Kickstarter that 
almost two thirds of the amount that Kickstarters generally get come in the first 48 hours and the last third in the last 24 hours. That means that they're only $1,000 away from funding. They've still got you know, five days left to fund, including that last period that usually generates a third of their funding. So they're gonna fund, they'll be fine, even though they're sitting at 97% right now. Now, the Shadow Planet, the board game, is a medium light game for three to five players. So there's no solo mode and you can't even play it with two players. Uh, and I would say the risk on this one is medium high. The reason for that is it's uh, being published by Galacta. They're a Polish company and they publish a lot of translations of games in Poland. So, you know, Polish translations of games for Poland. And they, they publish a lot, a lot of games. So they've done a lot of publishing and I would assume they have decent enough pockets. However, they have only kickstarted one game before, which is called Waste Nights Second Edition. I actually back that and I own it. And I think it's a really good game. So I trust Galacta and I think even though they've only you know, done one Kickstarter before, they have this funding because they are a big publisher in Poland. Now, this game uses deck building and hidden roles. It's a semi-co-op. It's this kind of interesting amalgamation of gameplay. It seems to borrow a little bit from deduction games, but also games like Nemesis, maybe Dead of Winter, like trader games. Uh, and so there's gonna be this crew of astronauts who've crash landed on a foreign planet and they need to get their, sh their spaceship working again and take back off. The problem is there's an alien force on this planet that's going to try to, kind of like the thing, get inside at least one player, if not more. And there is a guardian on this planet who wants to stop that creature from leaving at all costs. Pretty neat, right? But what makes it even more interesting is that players are not playing certain characters players will actually decide what characters they want to play in a round. And when they choose that character, they will inherit that deck. They'll get to use that character's deck building deck for that round. And they'll get to alter the deck, maybe make it better if they're you know, an astronaut who wants to leave the planet or maybe sabotage it and make it worse if they're the alien or the guardian. So I think I haven't really seen that before. The idea that everybody's kind of playing all characters, yet someone may still be kind of like the alien or the guardian. But I, I like that idea of the rotating gameplay. It's, it's new. I haven't seen it before. So I'm, I'm fascinated by this game. Now, I don't think I am going to personally back this game. Uh, there's just a lot of other stuff I'm backing right now. But if one or two things that I'm thinking of backing kind of I decide not to, I may jump on this. And I don't know how good this game is going to be right now. But I, I really want to play it at some point, even if I don't back it personally. So the designers on this, let's kind of move forward to that. The designers on this are Giacomo Santo Pietro. Uh, he has worked on Death Note Investigation Card Game. That's kind of the, the only thing he's really done. And Gianluco Santo Pietro. So I assume they're related. And he has worked on some other things. He's worked on Kingsport Festival, uh, Letters from Whitechapel, and White Hall Mystery. And those last two are kind of uh, deduction games. So there is kind of some crossover with what this game does. The artists on this are Alan D'Amico, who's worked on Blitzkrieg World War II in 20 minutes, uh, Wendake, and White Hall Mystery. And... Demi Savini, who's worked on Garibaldi the Escape, Kingsport Festival, and Ventura. Now, there's two pledge levels for this game. There's a $49 level that will get you the core box and the stretch goals. And for $67, there's a pledge level that adds a graphic novel. Now, none of those pledge levels will include these hazards out of space mini expansion, but you can add that on for five euros. <laughs> this game will fund on May 5th and it will tentatively deliver in December 2021. Next up is a game called Board Royale, New Expansions and Second Printing. Now, I was sort of interested in this the first time around. There was a Kickstarter maybe a year or two ago for the original game. Uh, it looked kind of like Survivor, the board game. It's not just Survivor in terms of a game show. You're actually trying to kill everybody else on this island. But it uses a uh, deck building mechanic. There's player elimination, obviously. And the original game was kind of cutthroat. So you've got decks of cards that have resources. You've got weapons and things that you can stumble upon. 
uh, and, and maybe ammunition for it, different, different ways to kill people. So you're trying to you know, get your hand built up and then either kill everybody else or get certain resources that will allow you to escape from the island. But that first iteration of the game was just all competitive and it had about five different decks. So you could get different decks that would put different themes in the game, different kind of weapons packs and missions and things like that. So with this new iteration of the game, They've added in like five more packs, but they're sort of cooperative. So you can do things together as a, as a team. And this game is light. It is a very light game. It plays two to six players. I would probably characterize the risk on this one as high just because the, the company that's doing this have only produced one Kickstarter before, which was the original Board Royale game. It came off well, I think, um, but I, I like to have a company have delivered at least two or three games to sort of promote them to a medium high versus a high uh, risk assessment level. So this one's kind of still sitting at high. Board Royale was looking originally for $24,000 in minimum requested funding. They're at $195,000 right now, which is eight times their initial asking price. Now it's designed by a trio of designers who all worked on the first game, but that's all they've done. In fact, this whole company all the artists and the designers, they're in board royale. Like this is the thing that they've done to kind of get noticed and be their first game. So the designers working on this are Attackin Kankurur, Merrick Tanzer, and Tuna Pamir. And the artists are Ali Yagis Kani, Ken Ogan, and Ibrahim Haki Uslu. And apologies if I murdered any of those names. And it's produced by Arvis Games Inc. Again, that's the company making this, the publisher, and all they've done before was the first Board Royale game. Let's talk pledge levels. And so for $27, you can get the base game and a secret weapons pack. So that is stuff that was produced previously. For 48 bucks, you can get all the new stuff. So it's all these kind of cooperative packs and things. For $62, you are basically combining those two pledge levels. So you'll get those two things. You'll get like the original base game, the secret weapons pack, all the new stuff, and then you'll get a Kickstarter exclusive box and a travel bag. Now, if you pledge at the $93 level, you will get everything basically made for Board Royale to date, which means in the previous levels, you weren't getting all of that first pledge stuff. You were just getting the base game and the secret weapons pack, but the $93 level will add in all of the previous stuff. So it's everything. There is, however, a pledge level for $297, which is a huge jump up. Um, and the reason for that is they're, they're just looking for people to throw them extra money. It's sort of a vanity level of pledging. Uh, something, when I say something has vanity rewards, it basically means that they're going to draw you a card for your game, you know, based on you or put you in the game or do something that like is very specific to you. Uh, that's why it's called a vanity reward because it's putting you in the game or it's adding your name to something or designing something. You get to design something or they get to design something based on you. And usually when they do that, they're doing that because it's only gonna affect your copy. Usually, sometimes that card goes into the whole package, but usually it's just going into your copy. So you're, you're paying to personalize it a little bit and make it a little bit special. So the price goes up significantly. So it's not something that everyone wants or needs. It's only something that you would want if you really like the game and you have a lot of extra cash to throw away. So at this $297 pledge level, you will get all of the stuff that we've talked about. Plus, you'll get this kind of license that they've made and you will get uh, cards from the first sample of the game. So we're talking probably like a production uh, copy. It's gonna fund on May 6th, and then it will tentatively ship in November 2021. And I think the reason for that is they've already produced a lot of this, and some of this is the old version of the game. From there, we have Cellulose, a plant biology game. And this is gonna fund on May 6th. So the minimum requested funding for this was $25,000. They're currently sitting at $200,000, which is about eight times their requested funding. This is a medium light game, although I think it's kind of sitting on the high end of medium light, almost up to medium heavy. And it plays one to five players, so there's a solo element here. And I would put the risk at this one at medium low. And the reason is it's being produced by Genius Games 
and they've done a bunch of these kind of educational games, but they're not the kind of educational games where it looks like someone slapped together a crappy prototype copy and they're just trying to make some money and no, this is this is well designed game. This is this is not a slapdash uh, educational thing that people have thrown together and are calling a board game. This is a legitimately good board game that also happens to teach kids a lot, and their whole line does this. They've made a lot of these games, and they're kind of like they're educational games, but they're also like very Euroy. With I think I haven't played any of them yet, but it seems to me that they're. They have good choices and they're crunchy and there's a lot going on. It's well designed. So Genius Games in the past has also produced uh, Cytosis, Ecosystem, Genotype, uh, Periodic, and Subatomic. And this one is sort of a worker placement with set collection. Now it is designed by John Covey, who designed Cytosis, Periodic, and Subatomic, and Steve Schlepphorst, who worked on a game called Math Rush, which is not as popular as those other games, but it's also uh, published by Genius Games. And the art on this is by Tomas Bogus, who did art on Cytosis, Periodic, and Subatomic, so he's worked a lot with Genius Games. Now the standard version of this game is uh, the $39 pledge level. If you want to pledge for $55, you're going to get the Collector's Edition, which includes upgraded components. That means they're wooden components instead of the normal cardboard components, metal coins, and an insert. So, you know, the standard upgraded stuff. And then for $99, you can get the Collector's Edition with those upgraded components and a copy of Cytosis, which this game has a lot in common with. This game is almost kind of a sequel to Cytosis because cellulose is still dealing with uh, cell actions. It's just dealing with plant cell actions instead of the animal cell actions in Cytosis. So this game will fund on May 6th and it will tentatively deliver December, 2021. Following that, we've got another May 6th funder. That is, it's a wonderful kingdom. And this is sort of a spiritual sequel to It's a Wonderful World, but it is standalone. It is also one to two players. It's a Wonderful World, I believe, played one to four players. Uh, it was kind of a card drafting and resource management game, and it had uh, some campaigns to it. It looked pretty cool. I did not pick it up. Um, I'm actually planning on backing this one because I, I sort of regret not picking up It's a Wonderful World. I think it looks really good. I just wasn't sure at the time if I wanted another kind of cube pusher that was essentially, you know, resource management. But I'm going to do this one. It's for one to two players, so I know I'll be able to play it just with my fiance and I. We can probably just blow through it, and I think it'll be a lot of fun. So they were originally asking for 42,000 minimum funding on this one. They're at 430,000 right now, so that's 10 times the requested funding. So they're looking good. As I mentioned before, it is a medium light game plays one to two players, and I'd put this on the medium low risk. It's being published by La Boat de Joux, and they have done Call to Adventure, Dinogenics, It's a Wonderful World, of course, and Outlive. It is designed by Frederick Gerard, uh, who worked on Elos, It's a Wonderful World, and Meeple Land. And the art here is by Anthony Wolfe, who also worked on It's a Wonderful World, as well as King of Tokyo, and a game called Zombie 15. For $37 on this one, you're going to get the base game. For $61, you're going to get a bunch of extras thrown in. Uh, just some expansions, better components, and stuff like that. However, just know there is no way in this campaign to get It's a Wonderful World. So you can't add that on. There's no higher pledge level where you can pick that up if you missed it. I'm a little sad about that. I wish there was. I would, I would be getting that and pledging more. Uh, so you're only going to be able to get It's a Wonderful Kingdom here and it will deliver tentatively in January, 2022. From there, we go to Hellboy the Board Game Expansions and Dice Game. And this is a little sad, I think. It will fund May 7th. Uh, they were asking for a minimum requested funding of $69,000. They're sitting at $340,000, so they're good. They're at five times their, their minimum funding. I put this one at a medium heavy game. High end of medium light, medium heavy probably. It plays one to four players and essentially it is a miniatures co-op game. Um, you're playing as Hellboy. It's a dungeon crawler, really. But it's, it's very specific to Hellboy. 
Uh, it is published by Mantic Games, and they have done such games as Dreadball, Dungeon Saga, and Hellboy. So they haven't done that much stuff, which I think may be part of the issue here. The issue being that the board game and all of the original expansions and the first Kickstarter are not offered here. So if you don't have the board game, there's no reason to pledge this unless you go and get it at retail, which you can do. It is available at retail right now, and I think some of the expansions from the first Kickstarter are available, but I don't know if they all are, and I don't know if you can get all of the Kickstarter starter extras. Probably not. So it's a little disappointing that you can't pledge this campaign and then pick up all of the stuff from the first campaign if you don't already have it. That means for me, I won't be backing this. Um, C'est la vie. But the... Uh, Designers, let's talk about them. So James Hewitt is the designer here. He worked on Blood Bowl, the first Hellboy, and Warhammer Quest Silver Tower. Uh, Sophie Williams is also back for this one. She worked on the first Hellboy, but that seems to be kind of her first design. The artists on this, you've got Mike Mignola, who is the Hellboy artist. And I know a lot of people think his name is pronounced Mike Mignola, but they're wrong. <laughs> it's actually pronounced Mike Mignola. That's how you pronounce his name. I think most of the world is, is mispronouncing his name. That's okay. Now you know, it's Mike Mignola. And there's also art on this by Jose David Lanza Cebrian. He worked on the first one as well. He's also worked on Champions of Midgard and Rum and Bone Second Tide. So if you wanna pledge this campaign, it's just one pledge. It's $110. That's gonna get you the new expansions. I think there are four of them. I think they're kind of smaller expansions and the dice game. And if you don't want the dice game, too bad. You're pledging the dice game. And the dice game has different uh, designers, but I'm not gonna talk about them because I, I didn't write down their information before I started this video. And who cares about a dice game anyway? No, I'm just... No, so there is one pledge level for this. So you'll be getting the four expansions. I think it's four and the dice game, and it will fund on May 7th, and it will deliver tentatively June 2022. Okay, so I apologize for a moment. I actually forgot to record this part of the video <laughs> the first time around. I actually left this game out. So I had to go back and re-record this on another day, and this may not match. Uh, I am wearing the same shirt though, so, you know consistency, at least in theory. I may not look the same. Anyway, uh, also on May 7th, uh, Hex Explore It, the new Hex Explore It game is funding. This one is called Hex Explore It, the Domain of Mirza Noctis. Now this is the fourth game in this series. It's essentially a somewhat open world dungeon crawlery co-op adventure game with miniatures. Uh, what makes this game different though than a lot of other dungeon crawlers is it is sort of more on the level of a role-playing game or like kind of Dungeons and Dragons. And I say that because you're going to get player boards um, and you're going to write all your stats into them. And then you can get additional add-ons for things like class and race and aspect. And the more of these games you get, the more of these additions that you're going to be able to add onto your character to give them you know, more, more things. But gear in this game and things like classes and races, everything is really just represented by pure math and it's done on these dry erase boards. So while I've heard great things about the games, uh, Jeremy Howard at Jambalaya Plays Games and Man Vs. Meeple is a huge fan of these games. You should know what you're getting into these. So it could seem to somebody like it's very kind of hard mathy. Uh, there's less artwork. There is artwork for the bosses you're going to be fighting and the character classes that you're playing, but often it's on the back sides of the player boards where you never even see this artwork. And again, when you're computing stats and stuff, the game doesn't really do it for you. You're going to kind of just need to update your overall stats. So if you get gear, you're not really paying attention to that gear, you're just adding the stats from that gear into your base stats. And that'll give you a new number and you'll use that. So essentially everything kind of gets baked into the numbers. But 
other than that, it looks really fascinating to me. It looks like a fun series of games. Uh, they're differently themed. The first one was, I think, called The Dead King, and you were wandering around the countryside and fighting all of these smaller bosses. And then eventually The Dead King came out and started going around the land and corrupting things. And the idea was that you needed to build yourself up powerfully enough that you could then confront and defeat this huge boss for the whole game, the Dead King, the, the namesake of the game. So they went on and they did two more games, The Forest of Admiron and The Sands of Shurax, and each one's getting a little bit more popular and kind of getting the, the brand out for this company in this game. Now, the new one is called The Domain of Mirza Noctis. This one's kind of more horror themed. It takes place in almost like a Transylvanian type setting with monsters, whereas, you know, the original one was kind of this fantasy, uh, dead fantasy world with, with a dead king. Uh, the second one was the Forest of Admiron, so it was more, you know, forest themed. And the third one was the Sands of Shirax, and it took place in the desert with these giant kind of sandworms and stuff like that. So the themes have changed a little bit from game to game. Uh, the mechanics have developed as well. So I hear the best ones are the first one, if you're just going to jump on, and the new one, because with the second and third games, they sort of developed and evolved the, the mechanics and made them sort of more complex. And with this fourth game, they're now sort of pulling it back, paring it back a little, and getting down to kind of what works. So if it was your first entry, into this series, you may want to start with the first game on this Kickstarter, or you may just want to pledge for the newest game. They're all standalone, so you don't need the other games to play any one game, but they do work together, so you can sort of import characters and classes and races from one game to another. So this game will fund on May 7th. Their minimum requested funding was $35,000, but it's currently sitting at $420,000, which is just about 12 times their requested funding. Uh, this is a heavy game, probably because of all the number crunching and the mathiness of it, and the fact that the theme, uh, sometimes with some of the artwork being on the backside of player boards and things like that, some of the theme is kind of more in, in your head as you're playing. Although there is a, a cool map that you're sort of building with all these chunky connected hex tiles. So it, it is a heavy game. It plays one to six players, so you can play it solo. And I'd put the risk on this one to medium high. Now. It's a company and a set of designers who have only done this series. They don't really have any other published games behind them. But they have put out three of these games previously, and they've delivered them successfully. So they're sort of in the groove with the winning formula here. And I also think that each time they do a campaign and they sell more of the older games and reprints and things, they're just building up their brand. They're building up the solubility of this company. I don't think it's a high risk for this publisher, but I don't think they've proven themselves as a medium low risk either. I think they're still kind of in the medium high level. Now, this game is published by Mariucci Designs, and they've done exclusively these other Ex Hexplorit games. The designing trio behind these games are Kat Kiminuri, Nathan Luz, and Jonathan Mariucci. And Jonathan Mariucci is the namesake of the publisher Mariucci Designs, so it's, it's his company. And all three designers, along with the publisher, have just worked exclusively on these four games. Now that's also true of one of the artists, his name is Giannis Cardin, he's worked on all four games. He was the only artist who worked on the first game, the, the Valley of the Dead King. Then for the second and third games, they brought in a second artist, and his name was Conrad Langa, but he is he worked on those second and third games, and he is no longer working on the fourth game. So for the fourth game, there is a new second artist on board, and his name is Alvaro Nebat, and he also worked on Gloomhaven previously. So that's sort of the big item on his resume. Now, there are several different price pledges on this one. For $64, you can get just the base game. But all of these games kind of come designed with a base game, an expansion, and a living card deck. So if you want to get that bundle for the domain of Mirza Noctis, it's going to be $99. Now, you can add on other games in the uh, pledge manager if you want as add-on. And if you get the other games bundled in that same kind of bundle where you've got the base game, the expansion, and the living card deck, they're $99 each, okay? Um, so just be aware of that. I'm gonna come back to that in a second. If you pledge at the $124 level, you're going to get everything for the domain of Mirza Noctis, plus you're gonna get this hero chest, which you can also get as an add-on for $34. But 
if you get the $124 pledge level, it will be bundled in with all of the Mirza Nocta stuff. So the reason you may want the hero chest is that it is a sort of big box that contains all of the games, all four of the games. So if you have games previously, or if you're planning on picking up all or most of these games in this pledge, you probably want that hero box. Now, if you are really excited about this campaign and you've given it a look and you are still really excited, even after looking at the part where the artwork is on the backsides of some player boards and you realize it uses dry erase on those boards uh, and, and you've thought about the mathiness and, and you're excited and you want to play this game and you want to go all in on it, you want to get everything, then instead of getting the add-on with each of those packages $99, you can get a bundle for everything. So it's going to be all four of the games, all four of the base games, all four of their expansions, and all four of their living card decks, and that big heroes box. And that pledge will be $390. So it's a little bit cheaper than getting each of the four games for $99, plus you're essentially getting that hero chest thrown in for free. There's one more thing you may want to add on. And I guess they've gotten more confident in their abilities and perhaps their artwork has progressed from game to game. I think that's probably what's happened. So they're now putting out encounter decks for the first three games, which are essentially the same encounter decks in the games themselves, but with reworked artwork, which Mariucci seems to think is better. So if you want those decks, which don't exist for the fourth game. The fourth game doesn't need it because the fourth game has all new art. But if you want any of those decks, they are gonna be $12 each, or you can buy a bundle for $27 with all three of those card decks, one for each of the three games. So if you're really going all in and you're doing that $390 pledge, you may wanna consider getting the new updated art for these encounter decks and throwing out that $27 add-on into your pledge. Now, this game will deliver in June 2022, but because a lot of this stuff in this uh, campaign are previously produced games, perhaps reprints, but they've already been made before, if you order the previous stuff, you can do shipping options that will deliver some of the content, the content that was produced earlier in August 2021. So you're either gonna do one or two wave shipping. If you're getting only new stuff, it'll come in June 2022. If you're just doing one wave shipping and it does include the new stuff, everything will get shipped in June, 2022. But if you're only buying the old stuff or if you're buying a combination of things and you're doing two wave shipping, you will get those previously produced items in August, 2021. And that is Domain of Mers and Noctis. And again, it funds on May 7th, but this one is not on Kickstarter, it is on GameFound. So if you're interested, head over to GameFound to check it out. And as always, the links to all of these campaigns are down below in the comments. Uh, you can just click on show more and it'll list you all those currently running campaigns and their links. So you can just hit it, boom, it'll pop you over. And then you can see the campaigns with your eyes and make your own decisions. Okay, moving on to the next game. From there we go to transmissions. Now this will also fund on May 7th. It's got a minimum requested funding of $35,000. They're currently sitting at $140,000, so that's about four times their asking price. This is a light game, so I will not be pledging this because it's too light for me. But it is a great little light game that is an introduction to a bunch of mechanics like worker placement, set collection, rondelle, a few other things. Um, and it's also based on the art of Matt Dixon, who has a comic strip and, and stuff called Transmissions. So it's using his uh, artwork as a jumping off point. The designer actually liked his stuff so much, he said, I want to design a game around this. And, and, and so it happened. And the designer is Adam West, not Adam West who played Batman back in the 60s, different Adam West. Uh, and he has worked previously on Deadline and Galactic Emperor and Ninjato. It is published by Crosscut Games, which is Adam's company, and they have published in the past Deadline, Galactic Emperor, and Kodachi. And then the art on this is by Matt Dixon, who, you know, it's, it's taken from his art. It's inspired by his art. So he's one of the artists on this. He has also worked on a few other board games, though, back in the day. So he worked on Call of Cthulhu, the card game, Kaijudo, and War Machine Prime MK2. 
It's also got the art of Peter Gifford, who has worked on Ninjato, Tales of the Arabian Nights, and Traders of Osaka. Now, at the $20 pledge level, you're gonna get some robot minis. No game, just robot minis. The robot minis are really cool, and if you're a big Matt Dixon fan, but you don't care about the game or board games, you still might wanna get those, uh, those miniatures just to paint. Put them up on your bedroom shelf, it'll look cool. If you want just the game, you can get the game for a $40 pledge, which will include standees. So no minis, just the standees. If you wanna go whole hog here and you want the game and you wanna play it with the minis, which let's be honest, that's the way that you should do it, unless money is tight, that pledge level is 54 bucks. And again, this game will fund on May 7th and it will tentatively deliver January, 2022. From there, I'm gonna to talk to you about Canvas Reflections Expansion and Reprint. Now this is a game that I personally did not back the first time around, but I am gonna back this time. Uh, it will fund on May 11th. Uh, they had a minimum requested funding of $50,000, and right now they're sitting at $567,000. They're 11 times the asking price. It is a light game for one to five players. Um, I'm not sure if the original was one to five players. It might have been two to five, but there is now a solo mode if there wasn't before. And I would put the risk level on this one at medium high. And uh, the reason why is because it's being published by Road to Infamy Games, and they just really haven't done that much. They did a game called After Nova and a game called Crypt that I don't think most people have heard of, and they did Canvas. So Canvas was kind of their the Kickstarter that launched them into hopefully the big time. So I'm sure I will, in time, downgrade them from medium high to medium low, but I'd like to see a few more Kickstarters from them first. Uh, this is a card drafting and set collection game, and it uses these kind of overlay cards where it's clear and then you put cards in these sleeves and you're building up an image over time using several of these kind of overlays. It's a technology people may have seen before in games like Gloom, where players are trying to miserably murder their own family members. You may have also seen it in Mystic Veil vale and some other John D. Clare games like Edge of Darkness or the soon to be shipping Dead Reckoning. So it's, it's out there, it's in a few games, but it's a cool little uh, mechanism, technology, I guess, really. And the reason I didn't back this the first time around is that I already have a couple painting theme games. I have Kanagawa and I have Bob Ross Art of Chill game, which despite being sort of a, I think it was a Target exclusive originally, but it's, it's, it's not a bad game. It's actually a pretty good little game. So I sort of felt like I didn't need another uh, painting game. But once this game delivered and it seems to be very beloved, people are really enjoying it. I think I need to reevaluate and get the game and play the game. And perhaps I will get rid of one of those other two games. Probably Kanagawa since my fiance Kristen is a huge Bob Ross fan and I'm probably not allowed to sell that game. So let's talk about designers and artists. So the designer on this is Jeff Chin, who worked on After Nova, Canvas, and Crypt, as well as Andrew Nerger, and he, he worked on those same games. So they are kind of Road to Infamy games. They're, they're the designer and the publisher, they're all, it's all the same stuff. They are working together, this is their thing. Now, the artist on this is Luan Hun, and she has worked on Canvas, that's it, so just Canvas. But if you've seen the art for Canvas, it's awesome, it's fantastic, it's really cool. So on this campaign for 25 bucks, you're gonna get Reflections, which is the new stuff. Just the new stuff. For $35, you're going to get Deluxe Reflections, which again is gonna add in upgraded components, which is going to include wood tokens instead of cardboard ones, um, extra reversible cards in case the ones that you have get shoddy or something, you've got some backups, and, and a few other extra things. Now, also for $35, and this is a separate pledge level, you can get just the base game. So if you if you don't have it at all, and you're a little unsure, and you don't know if you want it, but you, you wanna try it out with the base game, you can pledge the base game by itself at that pledge level. For $45, you're going to get the deluxe version of the base game, just the base game. For $60, you're gonna get both Reflections and the old stuff, 
but it's the, the standard version stuff. And then for $80, you're going to get the deluxe version of both. And that's what I'm going to pledge. And this game will fund on May 11th, and it will tentatively deliver in February 2022. From there, I'm going to talk to you about a game I didn't think I was going to talk to you about, and that is Keeper at Sea. Now, this game funds on May 12th. Uh, they're asking for a minimum funding of $11,000. They're currently sitting at about $76,000, so about seven times their minimum requested funding. This is a heavy game for one to four players, and I would put this in the medium low risk. Uh, it is a tile placement and worker placement game. It is published by R&D Games, who publishes all of Richard Breeze's games. It's his company. And they have done games such as Keyflower, Cathedral, and Reef Encounter. And Richard Breeze, those same games. This is his company. Now, the art on this is by Vicki Dalton. Uh, and she has worked on the original Keeper base game, Keyflow, which is another Richard Breeze game, and Carcassonne Amazonas. So for $45, you can get this new expansion called Keeper at Sea. For $49, you can get the base game, Keeper. And the reason I almost didn't talk about this is this was not in the pledges originally. And I thought, oh, I don't want to recommend a game when you can't get the base game for it. That's just, that's, that's frustrating sometimes. <laughs> now, originally they had something called the Character Edition available through this campaign, but they had a very limited number of quantities, 150 copies. And I hadn't decided if I wanted to pledge the game. And before I decided that, they were all sold out of this, this character edition, which features like a lot of custom meeples. And it looks very cool. Um, and I actually have now pledged for it because somewhere along the way, one of the people that pledged for that edition uh, canceled their pledge. So I was able to jump on and get that. But if you can't get that, that's okay. You just need to be able to at least get the base game, right? And so now you can. Now you can get the regular Keeper base game. So that is the $49 pledge level. Uh, for $83, you can get both. So you'll get the original Keeper base game and this new Keeper at Sea. And then at the $143 level, that's where you get both. And then instead of the regular Keeper game, you're getting the character edition. Those are currently sold out. They only offered, I think, 150 of them. It was a limited quantity. But keep your eyes peeled if that's something that interests you because you never know. Especially in the last day or so, it's possible that people who have pledged that will cancel their pledges. And, and so maybe you'll be able to scoop it up. But if not, you can still pledge the regular Keeper base game and the Etsy expansion for $83. Now, again, this game will fund on May 12th and it will tentatively deliver in December 2021. And I guess the last thing I can say about this is that I've played Keyflower, which is one of Richard Breeze's other games, and it's fantastic. I would put it in a category of something like Concordia, where I think it appeals to and can be played by all levels of gamer. So it, it, it's sort of like, in my mind, occupies this very small space, which is games that maybe everybody should have in their collection because I think they can be played by everybody. They're, they just, they're, they're great games that have this wide appeal. And uh, yeah, so my, my love of Keyflower, which I do own, I picked up a copy of recently, is what has sort of like led me to explore more of Richard Breeze's games and Keeper at Sea, it also has this very kind of cool folding uh, boards that you use when you're getting resources. So you can't always get all of the resources, but the way you fold it up will control what resources you get that round. And I think it looks really cool and I'm, I'm pretty excited about this one. On May 13th, my father's work will fund. And this is a game that I am also backing and I think it looks pretty honking cool. I just use honking as an adjective, <laughs> but it does, it looks really cool. So they wanted uh, $10,000 for this game. That was their minimum funding, which is a little surprising because this game seems uh, sort of ambitious and it's got an app to it. So if you don't like app games, this is not going to be a game for you. However, Renegade Game Studios, the company publishing it, has already gone on record to say that they're planning on keeping this app running for a long, long time, and that if they ever don't keep it up, they will release it to kind of public domain so that people can keep it running. And I don't think there's risk of this going away anytime soon, but I mean, it is possible that if you get this game, 
you may not be able to play it in like 30 years or something if the app support goes away with the way, you know, te whatever technology it comes out. Anyway, this looks really cool to me. So it is a heavy game. It's for two to four players. And I would, I would say that it's a medium low risk on this one because it's being published by Renegade Game Studios, who's done a lot of games. It is a horror themed worker placement game. And it's a little bit like Abomination you know, where you, the, the, the worker placement game where you're kind of building Frankenstein. The difference in this one is it's got a little bit of a campaign feel to it. It's not a campaign. It doesn't have a campaign to it. But the game sessions in it take place over three generations of mad scientists. So over the course of this game, you are going to have one of your scientists die or retire or something and pass on his work to another generation and that will happen twice so you'll kind of have three ages in this game and that is really fascinating to me there's also a board and sort of a binder book that goes in the middle of this board and you can flip pages in this book and you will as things happen in the game so it's not a legacy game but Things are going to change every game depending on who triggers what and which pages you're turning and what worker placement locations become available to you or go away. And I like that. It sounds very, very thematic and sort of deep gameplay. It just it's, it sounds fascinating to me. So let's talk a little bit about the pedigree of the people making this game, shall we? As I said, it's being published by Renegade Game Studios, and they've got a whole ton of games they've put out. So... Uh, excuse my diverting eyes for a moment, but they've published Altiplano, Ex Libris, The Fox in the Forest, Fuse, Honshu, Lanterns, The Search for Planet X, Snow Tales, Trajan, Wendake, and World's Fair 1893. Now this game is being designed by T.C. Petty III. He has worked on Viva Java, the coffee game, Viva Java, the coffee game, the dice game, and Xenon Profiteer. So this does seem like if this game is really good, this could be the game that kind of like launches him into a higher level of uh, designer. Uh, the art on this is by three people and it's got some pretty cool art. It's by Eric Hibbler, who's worked on Junk Orbit, uh, Terror Below and Yukon Airways. So those are three games that have this very kind of like cartoony art, stylized cartoony fun art. But then the art is also by Damian Mamaliti, who's worked on Brass Birmingham, Brass Lancashire, Edge of Darkness, and Tyrants of the Underdark. So he has kind of dark themed art. So I'm very curious to get a look at all this stuff when you put it together and it's got this dark element, but also this kind of like, you know, a little, little more cartoony art. And then also uh, Janos Orban has worked on this game and Janos has worked on Artsy and Stellar and the upcoming Kickstarter Embarcadero. So this is just one pledge level for this. It's $99, you're either pledging this or you're not. And if you do, it will fund on May 13th and you will get your game, which will require the app to play February 2022, tentatively. Two games left. The second to last one is not a Kickstarter game. This game is on GameFound. It is after the Empire. It will fund on May 14th. They had a minimum requested goal of $25,000. They are currently sitting at $185,000, which is seven and a half times their asking price. This is a medium heavy game uh, as for one to four players. And I would put them, the risk on this one at medium high. And the reason I would do that is I think Gray Fox Games, who is well known and has made some good games, they. They've had some issues in the last couple of Kickstarters. So I have friends that backed Reavers of Midgard and had some issues with the components and the trays and the way that things shipped. I think Gray Fox eventually kind of cleaned that up and got components to people that needed replacements, but it was a bit of a fiasco. And I, and I think some of the components weren't as promised in the Kickstarter. And then I personally backed a game that they did. It's sort of a reprinting of uh, Sukuyumi Full Moon Down and that game is still trying to deliver. It's, it's sort of had all these problems, you know, with the pandemic and the Suez Canal and all these things. But for people who have already gotten that game uh, in Europe and stuff, they're reporting that the quality of a lot of the components are not as promised and subpar. So Gray Fox Games has kind of gone from medium low risk in my mind up to medium high. Hopefully they'll get their 
shit together and eventually they can go back to medium low risk, but just to be aware. However, this is sort of a reprint campaign. They, they funded this already a couple a year or two ago on Kickstarter. So this is a reprint campaign. So you're probably okay with it. Even though I'm saying it's medium high, for this game alone, it might be medium low since it's largely a reprinting and there's new stuff. Um, okay, so Gray Fox Games has previously done Champions of Midgard, Deception, Murder in Hong Kong, and Reavers of Midgard. This game is designed by Evan Halbert and Ryan Malk, and this is really their first published game. The art on this is by Yaroslav Radetsky, and he has worked on Reavers of Midgard and Rurik Dawn of Kiev. Now, there are two big pledge levels for this. There is a 99 pledge level, which will get you the deluxe game, and then there is a 149 pledge level, which will get you the deluxe game, plus some even more deluxe things, like game trays, neoprene mats, and a mini expansion. Now, if you already have the retail version of the, the first game, so if you got it without the deluxe stuff, and now you're saying you wanna get the deluxe stuff, you can also pledge for an upgrade kit for 29 bucks. And then finally, there's a solo mode here, but it is an extra add-on. It's, it's $10 extra. So if you want that solo mode, make sure that you add it on because it doesn't come with the other pledge levels. So as I mentioned before, this game will fund on May 14th, and then it will tentatively deliver somewhere between September and November of 2021. Uh, they're being a little vague about it because much of this game is already produced and they're trying to kind of get it out fast but they don't really want to say they can get it out by September and then not get it out by September. So they're saying four to six months, which means September to November. But it's a little different than other games because most of this game is already produced. And then the last game on our list for today is Station Fall. Uh, it will fund on May 16th. And it, they were asking for a minimum requested funding of $25,000. they are currently sitting at $96,000, so almost four times their asking price. This is a heavy game, and it is a heavy game for one to nine players, so it's got kind of a crazy player count. And I would, I would put the risk on this one at medium low. It's, um, it's being published by Ion Game Design, who publishes their own games, as well as the Sierra Madre games, which is Phil Eklund's imprint. Um, and they, they've published a lot of games. They delivered a lot of Kickstarters, so they've done this a lot. Now, this game is very kind of weird and interesting. It's a hybrid game that I'm seeing more and more, which is that it's a deduction game, but rather than being like games that, you know, people play these very light deduction games like Coup and The Resistance and stuff like that, it adds a pick up and deliver element and it's more Euro-y. And uh, a company called Burnt Island Games did a game similar to this called Into Deep. And I've seen one or two more of these as well recently. These kind of deduction games that have more kind of Euro stuff than just your very light deduction games. And I like that. I think I like deduction games in general, but I like my games heavy. So if it puts in a crunchy element like this, yes, please. Uh, and this game, as I said, is being published by Ion Game Design. They have done like the Bios series and the Pax series. So their three biggest games are Neanderthal, Pax Porphyriana, and Pax Renaissance. Uh, this game is designed by Matt Eklund, who is Phil Eklund's son. But he seems to be going off on his own more and more. And I, I think it's interesting that he's now designing games for Ion Game Design, the parent company, rather than for Sierra Madre. And I don't think that's a bad thing. But he has designed Pax Porphyriana, Pax Renaissance, and Pax Transhumanity. Now the art on this is by three artists. One is Anne Isaacson, and this seems to be her first published game. Also, Josephine Strand, who worked on High Frontier for All. That's another Ion game. And Madeline Fial, who worked on more Ion stuff and Sierra Madre stuff. Uh, Bios Mesa Fauna, Dawn on Titan, and Pax Viking. So for $64 on this one, you can get the base game. For $99, you're gonna get the base game with miniatures. Okay, there's also a pledge at $99 for the base game with the miniatures and this Project X Mini. So it's an additional mini, but that has limited quantities. So if you want the Project X Mini, there's still a lot left of these pledges. But if you want that mini, then pledge that level and do it quickly. <laughs> I mean, they may stay around for a while, but I, I'm not sure. I don't know how quickly they're going to go once it gets to sort of the end of the campaign. There's also a $129 pledge level that will get you all of that other stuff, 
plus a neoprene mat, but it won't have the Project X Mini. But there's a second $129 level that will get you, you know, the base game, the miniatures, the neoprene mat, and the Project X Mini. But that one, again, is a limited quantity. So if you want that, you just need to get there sooner than, than everybody else. Uh, but right now, as of now on, on Saturday, I'm recording this, May 1st, there are still plenty available in both of those two pledge levels. So this game uh, will fund on May 16th, and it will tentatively deliver December 2021. I think there's a pretty good sampling of games, different complexities, light to high, and some pretty cool stuff in there. I'm definitely backing a few of those, and I'll talk more about those next week. But right now, let's talk about the games that I backed from last week's video. So the first Kickstarter that I backed from the previous period is the Australia Big Box with the two new expansions. <laughs> and I didn't need to go all in on it because I already own the base game for Australia, which I really love. Uh, I'm a huge fan of designer Martin Wallace. I like a lot of his games, both of the brasses, uh, Birmingham and Lancashire, Age of Steam, Railways of the World, lots of stuff. Lots of good stuff from him. So I bought Australia a while back and I just think it's a really unique, cool game. It's got a time track on it. And once you get partway through the game, the old ones awaken. You know, who are these Cthulhu gods that are sleeping in the apocalyptic Australian countryside? <laughs> so players are building tracks and they are mining for resources and they're putting together armies that are gonna be able to fight off these creatures in different ways. One of the interesting little design flourishes of the game is that it's a semi-co-op. So if anyone in the game gets their home base, uh, their port destroyed by wandering uh, Cthulhu creatures and zombies and things, then the game will just automatically end. And the old ones will get to score. And if it's early on, they're gonna score higher than everyone in the game, so all the players are gonna lose. So players need to be conscious about what they're doing and working to make sure that the old ones that are being awoken and roaming around the board are not becoming too powerful and are sort of being taken down and dealt with as they appear. Then late in the game, players can go their own way a little bit more uh, and, and operate purely selfishly. But early on in the game, they need to be at least aware of that so they're not allowing the old ones to destroy one player's port and then prematurely end the game. It's a, But I love it. It's a great combination of this Cthulhu theme in a post-apocalyptic Australia. It's got Euro elements. It's got the time tracks. It's got the opponent that scores, this AI opponent that scores as well as the players. It's a really fun game. So I'm really excited to get a couple more expansions for it. And this was just an easy back for me. It's a great game. Next up, I backed Hippocrates which seems to be sort of a standard resource management drafting tile placement game. But the cool thing about this game is that players are helping Hippocrates uh, cure patients back in the day. And the way that the tiles kind of slot down and link together and the way that that affects gameplay seems pretty compelling to me. Uh, I'll need to get it and play it to see exactly where this lands. It does seem to perhaps have some crossover with games like Darwin's Journey, except instead of helping Darwin discover new species, you're helping Hippocrates cure patients. But I'll get it, I'll play it, I'll see where it lands, but it's from Game Brewer, who I, I'm really trusting these days. They've just made so many good games, and the design work and the artwork on it looks really good. So I think it's gonna be a medium light, uh, kind of Euro strategy game, not too complex, but good and solid. So I backed that one. I also backed John Company 2nd Edition, which is from Cole Worley's Whirligig Games. I own PAX Premier 2nd Edition. It's an amazing, very well-produced, extremely well-designed games. It's one of these games where I think if I were to pare down my, my board game collection to 10 or 20 games, it would make the cut. It's that good. It's a really good game. So John Company 2nd Edition is similar in that 
players aren't necessarily aligned with any one faction, but they can do things in the game to align themselves with factions that are in winning positions or or just factions that they hope to push into winning conditions. Now, in Pax Premier, you're aligning yourself with the various armies that are in this sort of three-army uh, confrontation. With John Company, you're aligning yourself with the various companies. There is a colonization theme, but it portrays the colonizers as not good, <laughs> you know, as, as pursuing selfish evil ends. So I'm less concerned about the colonization in this one. It's not disregarding it, and it's not making excuses for it. And I trust Cole Worley as a designer. He's, a, he's just a really good designer, so we'll see. I'll get this one. I'll see where the gameplay lands compared to PAX Premier. But if it's anywhere near as good as PAX Premier, this one's going to be a keeper as well. And then finally, I backed Three Sisters, which is a roll and write game by the guys who did uh, Fleet the Dice Game, Ben Pinchback and Matt Riddle. Uh, it has a farming theme, so I suppose if people like kind of like mobile farming games, the theme may appeal to them. But these guys have made some really good roll and writes, and I'm sort of, I don't own that many roll and writes. I own Roman Roll, which is a very heavy Roman write, and I backed Seven Bridges, which I didn't like and I'm getting rid of. So I still have room in my collection for more roll and writes. Now, I know I like Welcome To, and I know I like Cartographers, but I hear great things about Fleet the Dice Game, and so I wanted to back the new dice game from those designers. So I'm excited about Three Sisters as well. So those are the four games that I backed this period. Games that I've acquired. There are, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. So I've acquired eight games since the last period. Uh, the first of these is Isle of Sky from Chieftain to King. And I don't really know that much about this game. Uh, I know it's a tile placement and territory building game. I know that it has a really good reputation. And I know that it's by one of my favorite designers, Alex Fister, who did Great Western Trail and Mombasa. Uh, so it just seemed like this is a game that I should have played a while ago and I need to sort of get it played and see what I think of it. It has several expansions. So if I really like it, there are ways to expand the game. So I'm looking forward to playing this one. Um, I think it'll be a hit. I mean, he's a good designer. This is a lighter game. Uh, and I just, I know John gets games. He, he raves about it. So I'm looking forward to playing this one. Uh, I also picked up Keyflower, which I have played in the past. It's by Richard Breeze. And it is just a great, very unique worker placement game. Uh, I suppose it's also territory building. You're kind of building this little area and you're using worker placement actions. And there's some betting and bluffing that goes along with that. And... The design style of the game is just very different from any other games I've seen, uh, any other worker placement games. It's very much, I think, part of Richard Breeze's design style and the way he thinks. And he is brilliant. It's a brilliantly designed game. And in my mind, it sort of occupies that same position as like Concordia, where it's just such a good game and it's in this middleweight area that I think can be played by pretty much all players. So it's just, it's a solid game to have in any collection. It's just, it's good stuff. Uh, I also received Mercado de Lisboa, which is a new lighter game designed by Vital Lacerda using some of the design of Lisboa. I've already put out a video on it, so you can go see my take on that. But I, I don't know how long I'm going to be keeping Mercado de Lisboa. It is a light game. There aren't really a lot of good strategic choices in the game. I think it's good to use this game to introduce someone to Lisboa. And I plan on playing through the solo campaign. It's like a nine game campaign, maybe playing it once or twice at higher player counts. And if the game is as limited as it already seems, at that point I'll probably do a full review of the game and my score will probably be downgraded from what I rated it during my first impressions video, and then I'll probably sell the game. Um, it just, I don't think it has the variability or the replay that it really needs to stay in my collection. So, but I was happy to take a chance on it. The Tall Lacerda is one of my favorite designers, and I, I will continue to back his stuff. I think we all need to get in the habit of expecting that artists are not going to hit a home run every time, and that's okay. We have to give them the opportunity to hit singles or even 
if I'm using a baseball metaphor, even strike out occasionally. Because if you don't take risks and you don't take chances, you're never going to have those big swings. You're never going to have those home runs. Uh, you, you have to swing to hit the ball. And if you swing, you're going to strike out from time to time. So yeah, I think Mercado de Lisboa will not be a game that, that stays in my collection forever. I also received Red Rising, which is the new Stonemeyer game. Uh, I'm a little apprehensive about this one because I was not a fan of Tapestry. I thought it was not play-tested enough, not a civilization game as it was marketed to be, and just very, very uh, unbalanced, kind of all over the place. So I haven't sold it yet. I'll probably give it a couple other plays. I'm talking about Tapestry now, but eventually that game is headed out of my collection. And then Pendulum, I didn't even bother with. As a real-time game, I just didn't want to have anything to do with it. So I once really liked Stonemeyer and pretty much wanted to buy everything that they put out. But over the last couple of years, uh, I'm finding that the games that they have made recently are not really appealing to me. Red Rising, I'm hoping, is different. It's a lighter game. It's uh, very much a, a card drafting game and a set collection game, and we'll see how it plays. I know it's also kind of themed off of a series of novels, which I haven't read, uh, so I don't have any personal connection or stake in the theme. I've heard alternately that the books are good and that they're problematic, so I don't know. I suppose if I like the game, maybe I'll read the first book and see what I think, but I need to get it played first, and it probably will get played very soon. And you'll probably see a first impressions video from that one coming soon. I also received Stronghold Undead, which I am very excited about. It is a heavy two-player game. There are sort of two different games baked in. There's the original Stronghold and the Undead expansion, but they've made them into one kind of big second edition Kickstarter package. And it's a tower defense game. It's sort of two-player, you know, 1v1. It looks fantastic. I'm really excited about it. I also acquired Taverns of Tiefenthal, which I haven't played yet. I don't really know too much about it. I know it's designed by Wolfgang Warsh, who designed The Mind, which I don't love, and Quacks of Quedlinburg, which is perhaps the only game with a catch-up mechanism that I really like. It's very luck-based. Uh, players are drawing tokens out of bags, and it's just its pure joy. It's a lot of fun to play, but it is very luck-based, and it has a catch-up mechanism that can make some of the gameplay feel purposeless, I guess, a little bit. I'm not a huge fan of catch-up mechanisms in general. Uh, I don't, it, it often to me feels like it defeats the purpose of the game if no matter how players are playing, they're all scoring almost the same amount. I don't like catch-up mechanisms in general in Quacks of Quedlinburg because the game is so luck-based anyway, and it's light, and it's just kind of a fun little experience. It doesn't really bother me in, in that game. So I'm a big fan of Quacks of Quedlinburg. He also designed uh, That's Pretty Clever and Twice as Clever. I haven't played those yet. And Wavelength. And uh, I mean, a lot of eclectic, really diverse games. And so I, I thought, you know, I have to check out Taverns of Tiefenthal because that's sort of more Euro-y of the games that he's designed and, and more appeals to me. And then lastly, I acquired Vast, The Mysterious of Manor. I'm a huge fan of Root. I like leader games a lot. The original Vast is still kind of hard to find and out of print, so I grabbed this one and I'm, I'm really excited to play it. I really like the idea of factions with variable player powers to the point that they work very, very differently in Root and in this game. Uh, I find that kind of game fascinating with just all these different mechanics depending on who you're playing. And the theme of the Vast games is just a lot of fun. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to getting that one played and making a uh, review video on it. And then finally, let's talk about the games that I have played since I've made a update last. Uh, first up is Chronicles of Crime 1400. Now, this one I've played with my fiance a bit. Um, and 1900, the sequel game, has just released. So I'm trying to sort of finish playing 1400 and close it out. Now, when my fiance and I play it, we tend to play the case once or twice and just solve it as best we can. 
but I'm a completist, so I kind of want to go back and do everything that you can do and get a perfect score on it. And so I've gone back to the first few cases and I've completed those to my satisfaction. And I have, I think we need to play the last case together and then I have that one and maybe one or two others to play on my own. But I want to get that done before then moving on to 1900 and I imagine I'll probably have a first impressions on 1900 out soonish, but it'll, it'll be a few weeks. I'll finish 1400 first. Then I acquired Cryo, and I have a uh, first impressions video out on that one. I have to say, though, the more I think about Cryo, the more I'm a little worried about its replayability and longe longevity. So when I made my first impressions video on it, I was saying that I would rate it higher than Dwellings of Eldervale. Now I need to play Cryo more and play it at higher player counts, but because the worker placement actions in Cryo are so limited, I have a feeling that as I play it more, the score, my score on it is going to sink. Right now I have it rated higher than Dwellings of Eldervale, and I think, I think that's gonna happen. It's just too bad. I really like the theme, I like the art for it, but it feels like it needed more stuff in that game. Like it needs another, almost like an expansion or two to kind of just get enough mechanics to really have a lot of things to do. But we'll see. I need to play it more at higher player counts and, and just find out where it lands. Uh, I also played Garinto, which is a light game, an abstract game with chunky tile pieces kind of in the vein of Azul or Reef. And I like the game. I think it has good choices. I like the way it plays, but it's a little hard to set it up and take it apart because you have to create a huge uh, tableau of tiles every game and the tiles tend to stick together, which means that you're gonna be taking them apart at either in the beginning or the end of every game. And setting it up and taking those tiles apart will take a third to half the amount of time it takes to play the game almost. It's just, it's a little tedious process. It's not a big deal, but when you have other games like Azul and Reef that are kind of similar in their design and their ideas, I mean, they're, they play differently, they use different mechanics, but they feel similar to me. And those games don't have this thing in them. They don't have this, uh, the 10 minute kind of setup dealing with all the tiles. Uh, their setups kind of work with the tiles and not having to kind of separate them. So I don't know, over time that may be enough of a reason to get rid of it. We'll have to see. I need to play it more, I need to play it at higher player counts, and I like the gameplay of it, but those tiles could be problematic as time goes on. We'll see. Maglev Metro, which is a sort of train game from Ted Alsback, who did the Castles of Mad King Ludwig and Suburbia. And I really like it. I think it has a lot of good gameplay choices in it. There were several games last month that I really wanted to like, like Cryo. And then when I got into playing them, uh, the choices just felt underwhelming. The gameplay felt a little underwhelming. Maglev Metro was kind of the opposite. Uh, I was wondering if it was going to be a little dry, and I suppose if you don't like train games, you might think it's dry. But it, it plays differently than any other train game. Um, there's a huge player board, and you're using the passengers that you're picking up to kind of upgrade all of the actions and score points and create the ability to score more endgame scoring goals. There's just a lot of really good choices and to, to make in the game, and it's not, it doesn't feel boxed in the way some of those other games did, like Cryo, that I am starting to feel are a little more disappointing. I think Maglev Metro has enough things to do, enough strategies and tactics that you can employ that I think it will have a long life and, and a lot of replayability. So I, I really like that game a lot. Maglev Metro is actually the next game in line for a first impressions video, so you should see that in the next few days if you want to hear more about it. And then the last game I played is Mercado de Lisboa, which I talked about in the acquisitions and a little disappointed in it. Um, and I, I expect my experience with that game to to degrade further over time, so I don't know if it'll be a keeper. I, I, I suspect not, and I suspect that when I eventually put out my uh, full review for that game, my score will have gone down since my first impressions video. 
Anyway, that completes the video for today. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you're new to the channel, please consider liking and subscribing. And thanks very much for spending some time with me and hearing what I have to say about some of these games. I hope it was helpful and informative, and hopefully it helped you in the decision process with any of these currently ongoing Kickstarters that are funding in the next two weeks. So have a great weekend if you're watching this on Sunday. Otherwise, have a great week, and I will see you in the next video. Take care.